Hey everyone, welcome into OSLC Online. I'm Pastor Tim. Wherever you find yourself today, I am so glad you've carved out a section of your life to sit in God's word. We're gonna sing, we're gonna pray, and continue our series in the Psalms like we have been all summer long here. If you wanna access those previous messages and services, you can go to oslc.com slash watch and check those out, all right? Hey, today we are gonna be sitting with Psalm 69. It's known as an imprecatory psalm. You might never have heard that word before, but it's one of those words that just sounds gnarly, all right? It means judgment, all right? So uh, here's the question. Just whoever you are with today, kids, students, adults, gather together around each other and answer this question, all right? Just share the answer. When you get judgy, and you and I, we both know what that means, right? When we get judgy, do we get sweet or sassy, all right, sweet or sassy when you get judgy. 30 seconds, one, two, three, go. I think I get sweet. The rest of my family probably says I'm super sassy. So I'm probably a little bit of both. All right. So, um, man, however you encounter me, when I get judgy, there you go. Uh, heart on the sleeve, transparency, there you got it. All right. Hey, um, let's, let's just pray. And we're going to share communion right away because we have our worship team here in the same room with us today. Uh, it's part of our movement toward creating small, safe, and relational environments. And even though our worship team, oftentimes we see them up front leading us in song, them among themselves, they, they, they walk alongside of each other. That's what we're about, walking alongside of each other, making disciples who love God, love people, and live like Jesus. So it's an opportunity for them to gather together, to share life together, um, and we are just thrilled to have them leading our worship time today. So let's bow our heads and just ask God to be with us in this moment, and then we'll, we'll move into communion and worship. Uh, good morning, Lord. Thank you for today. We thank you for, for just your presence and, and your spirit among us. As you have promised, whenever two or three are gathered together, um, you're there. You, you are there. And you certainly are with us, not just in thought, uh, but through your word uh, and through literally each other because we know that the Holy Spirit lives in us. That's your promise, that you've sent your Holy Spirit to live in us. So as we prepare to receive this message today, the message of your love, your grace, uh, we're going to experience that here in this meal. So examine our hearts. Uh, lead us to admit that, that maybe there are things and thoughts and words and actions that we are not proud of, uh, that maybe we regret, uh, certainly that have broken your heart. And so uh, we just sit with that right now and, and share with you personally and silently those areas of brokenness that we're asking you to come to forgive, to heal, to mend. I love this verse in the book of Isaiah chapter one. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And I know it's summer, uh, we aren't thinking about snow, but my family and I, we were up at Mount Rainier here this last week and saw the glaciers and, and just the reality of when the sun shines on the snow, it is just so bright, it is so vivid. And that's how we look, not just to God, but to the darkness of the world around us. We, we are light in the darkness and it's because Jesus is the light that shines in our lives. And so know this, that your sin and my sin, our past, our present, our future, it's wrapped up in the personal work of Jesus who loves us, who forgives us in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Wherever you are, you can say amen, amen. You can take your bread and have it in front of you. Together we set it aside with the words of Jesus from the Gospels. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. 
this is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup. You can take your cups together. We set it aside. He had given thanks. He gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant that is given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And God's forgiveness through Jesus Christ is your peace. He brings us wholeness in the middle of our brokenness. So the peace of the Lord be with you always. And you can say also with you and also with you. Hey, wherever you are, you can share that bread. You can say the body of Christ is given for you. You can share the wine or grape juice. Say the blood of Christ is given for you. Together with your kids, your students, if there's adults even who are not receiving communion, sharing in this meal today, that's all right. Gather them together. Remind them that Jesus loves them all the time. Give them a hug, a high five, or if you're socially distant, air hug or air high five, that's fine too. All right. Just share, share God's love with each other. And hey, over the next 10 minutes or so, we are going to allow God's spirit to capture our hearts through song. Our worship team is going to lead us. And so let's stand wherever we are at. Let's stand, and we're going to sing our hearts out. Let's do that. Good morning, everyone. So glad that you're with us today in your living rooms, on your patios, in your front porch, wherever you are. We're so glad you're here. And um, it is so great to be reminded this morning that our God finds us right where we are and calls us to himself. And through his blood, he has cleansed us, as we just heard about. He is all-powerful, mighty, and has shown us over and over again his redemptive power. And so we want to praise him. We want to worship our God today. We taught you this song a couple weeks ago, and um, the chorus goes like this. Well, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Let's sing that again. Lord, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I search the world. Treasures of faith never enough. You came along, put me back together. Amen. Every desire is now satisfied. Here in your love. Still call me free. Amen. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again.
turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, no. that again. Lift it up. There's one voice. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing God is incredible, incredible and mighty, powerful. And uh, next song might be a new song for some of you. It's called King of Kings. And sometimes it seems these days in our current situation, our world is becoming darker and darker by the moment with everything happening. And all these things that we and our families are going through. social and political unrest. Yet, we're reminded in John chapter 1 that there is hope in the midst of the darkness. It says this, the Word became flesh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that light Life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. And we say, Amen, Lord. Thank you for your blood that covers us. Help us to shine your light where we are in this dark world. Let's sing this together in faith.
Hey everybody, I'm Dream Hoff, the Kids and Women's Minister here at Our Savior. I want to welcome you to our online children's message. Some things just work well together, like peanut butter and jelly, salt and pepper, cookies and milk. God created us to work with others too, and we have an awesome example of this in Mark chapter 2. Here we see a paralyzed man who couldn't walk. When Jesus visited the man's town, he might have wanted to go to him for healing, but people crowded around Jesus in the house to hear him teach, and the man was left behind. But his friends were creative and worked well together to find a way to bring him to Jesus. They carried their friend on his mat, which might have looked something like this. They opened a hole in the roof over Jesus' head and lowered their friend down through the rooftop. Talk about teamwork and creativity. Jesus saw the faith of the man's friends and forgave his sins and healed him so he could walk. In Psalm 69, David was really feeling down and cried out to God to be saved. The paralytic man might have felt down too, and his friends sure helped lift him up and back down again, wink, wink, by bringing him to Jesus. This week's bottom line is that God created you to work with others. How are you going to do that this week? Can you offer to help a neighbor? Can you do a job that needs doing around your own house without being asked? Can you support your friends by praying for them or sending your favorite Bible verse? There are lots of ways we can work with others and be a blessing to them. Let's ask God to help us with this. You can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for creating me to work with others. Give me strength and patience to do that this week. In Jesus' name, Amen. For more Bible fun, videos about today's lesson, and conversation starters for your family, head to the section called This Week's Bible Lesson in today's Kids News email. Your pictures from our Family Photo Challenge have been awesome. Keep them coming. This week, you can spell OSLC with objects from around your house and submit your family's photo by tomorrow night. Check out OSLC.com slash fam photo for details. See you later. I love those tea party photos and just want to share a couple of the ones that we received here this week. Check them out. All right. Uh, wow. <laughs> those are so fun. Those are for, so fun. But hey, this week's winner, this week's winner, it's the Eddington family. Eddington family. Hey, if you are the Eddington family, can you drop us a note, an email, complete a connection card? Let us know how best we can get you free pizza right there. And, and there's the picture of the kiddos enjoying their biscuits and tea, as they say, over the, the pond, right? Uh, or cookies and lemonade. What, whatever your tea party looked like, we hope that you had just a blast setting that photo up. And again, this week's photo challenge, spell OSLC, maybe YMCA style, I don't know. Introduce your kids to the village people. Or not, all right? Uh, OSLC, uh, spell it out. And Matt Keys there, he's our celebrity judge. Going to check it out. Check out all the photos. You can go to oslc.com slash photo to learn more. Upload your photo here before midnight tomorrow, all right? Hey, we are going to gather our thoughts and collect our thoughts as we move into our message time today. You're going to need a Bible, Psalm 69. We'll get there in just a moment. But together, let's share these words of our common faith, who we believe God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is to us. So together we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen? 
Amen. Amen. Hey, during our message time, um, you know, it, it's great to go through the Psalms. And let me just let you know where we're going here over the next few weeks. Next week, Pastor Matt's going to share on Psalm 20. All right, Psalm 20, it's a royal psalm. Uh, what, what does a royal psalm mean? How do we orient ourselves around the fact that Jesus is king? Looking forward to sitting in that scripture next week. And then the following weekend, can you believe it? The end of summer in many ways, it's Labor Day. Wow, that went fast. We're going to be sitting in Psalm 51. It's a psalm of rest and and can't wait to share what God has in store for us that weekend. And then we're going to kick off a new series in September. September 13th. Uh, It's a a great one. I cannot wait to walk through these weeks with you. We're calling it Jesus' Prayer List, all right? And if you've never sat with this spiritual practice of prayer before, uh, I believe that God is leading us as a church as individuals and collectively, maybe even as a community, to learn not just what's on our hearts to pray, but really what is Jesus praying for? What is Jesus' prayer list uh, itemized if he would write it down today? What is he praying for? We're going to spend time in John chapter 17 for about five weeks. So, So more on that a little closer to September. But for today, we get to sit in Psalm 69 and and at first I thought I drew the short straw out of everyone who is, is preaching here um, <clears throat> throughout this series because uh, this is not the most popular topic to talk about. Because we're going to talk about judgment today. Judgment. Um, and the word justice is really the process by which we arrive at judgment. Judgment's the verdict and justice is the process by which we arrive at that verdict. And, and really we're not talking about our justice or our judgment, but God's justice and God's judgment. Um, and so when we choose to sit in a psalm like this, uh, it, it becomes an incredibly difficult task. Uh, it, it's an incredibly difficult passage. So I'm going to pray because I need it, and, and I'm going to be praying that God's word would speak to you wherever you are today. All right? God, uh, be with us. Uh, you are with us. We ask that your wisdom, not mine, your word, not mine, uh, would speak Uh, We pray against the evil one that he would not distort or deceive or twist words, Lord, but we do pray for clarity, clarity of of your voice to be heard, to be received, to be felt, to be experienced here in these moments together. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus, amen, amen. Uh, Commentator, uh, theologian, uh, academic, Walter Brueggemann, this is what he said about the, the reality of the Psalms. He says, the Psalms explore the full gamut of the human experience, all right? The full gamut of the human experience from rage, and, and that would be anger and frustration uh, and, and just this feeling of, of, of emotion to hope, much like the sunrise over Mount Rainier, from rage to hope. He continues, and indeed, it would be very strange if such a robust spirituality lacked such a dimension of vengeance, for we would conclude that just at the crucial point, robustness had turned to cowardice and propriety. That is to say, anger and judgment, those are real aspects of not just the human experience, but those are real aspects of of God. Um, And why? (laughs) Why? Well, we know that injustice exists. Because there is injustice, there is inequity, there is discrimination, there is this reality on every level of the human experience, and it's just the way it is. And we know that that reality is not God's intended way of life. We know that as we look around at at our world and, and our own human experience, we know things are broken, we know things are not right, we know that this is not the way that God had designed us To live. And yet, and yet, we are discovering in the Psalms that these are timely passages speaking into our current context, giving us relevance and understanding, not just to the present times, but but maybe even to the future times of, of where God might be leading us. And so could it be, could it be that God's word today is going to be that powerful that as the psalmist says, God's word is truly a lamp to our feet and a light 
for our path, that we can see the light shining on where we are walking, instructing us in how we live like Jesus and what to do next. And so today we're going to look at Psalm 69. I hope you have that open. All right, if not, um, I'm going to give you a second to grab your Bibles and open to Psalm 69. Again, it's an imprecatory psalm, imprecatory. It's two, it's two psalms uh, that are major imprecatory psalms. This one... Um, and then there's, there's one, this is one of 21 other imprecatory psalms that speak of God's judgment. And so, so we have this reality of God's judgment, the verdict that all things are equal, and the justice, the process of getting there to the fairness and the equality that is achieved. And, and so if you don't hear anything else today, all right, if you just tune the, choose to tune me out here, know this, all right, justice matters to God. Justice matters to God. Justice matters to God because God chooses to bring his judgment into your life and mine, into our world through Jesus. Yes, justice matters. Justice matters. Justice matters. But don't take my word for it. Let's take God's word for it. Check out what Psalm 69 says. Psalm 69 Here we go. I'm going to begin in verse 16. This is David speaking. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to my soul and redeem me. Ransom me from my enemies. For you know, verse 19, my reproach and my shame and my dishonor, my foes are all known to you. Reproaches have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was no one. For the comforters, and I found no one. They gave me poison for food, and from my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. So here, here are the words of judgment that, that he continues. All right, verse 22. Let their own table before them become a snare, and when they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. Make their li- loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. For they persecute him who you have struck down, and they recount the pain of those you have wounded. Add to them punishment upon Upon punishment, may they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out from the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. Lord, teach us what these verses mean in Jesus' name. I'll forever remember May 25th. May 25th, 2020, 8 minutes and 46 seconds. And a man named George Floyd was dead. As we hear those haunting words, if you've seen the video, I can't breathe. As he continues, they're going to kill me. I can't move as he cries, mama, mama, mama. Since then, arrests were made and, and protests and other, other voices emerged, causing incredible tension in our worlds over the social injustices that are there. Indeed, justice matters. Justice matters. And those who are concerned, those who had become outraged, those who, even in the least bit, were moved by, by just this simple act. You don't even need to take one side of the aisle or the other. Just look at the act. We know that justice matters. And perhaps that's what makes a psalm like this, these words so, so tenuous and, and so hard and yet so relevant and relatable. Because both David and you and me and our world, we all want to write the wrongs that we see that that we experience again David the psalm writer you and me the world we all want to correct the wrongs that we see in the world and that we experience 
You see, justice matters to David. It's important to understand the context. David here, if you read the first part of the psalm, he is experiencing this personal woundedness. He is literally saying that I'm sinking. I feel like I'm drowning and and I've been falsely accused. And he has this negative self-talk going on over himself. And and in some ways, he's been victimized and abused. And in other words, he is sitting in his own, own worthlessness because he's listening to the voices that are saying that his faith is worthless and and people are literally laughing. If you look down at verses 10 and 11, he's, they're literally laughing because of his prayer for repentance. Perhaps you can relate. Life is just unfair. Would you agree? Life is unfair, and we live in an unjust world, <laughs> and life is just unjust. I mean, think about it. Uh, when it comes to age, there, there is this injustice when it comes to age. Uh, the older we get, the reality is that, that many older folks, they, they tend to lose their jobs or, or their jobs are adjusted based on their age, whether it's, it's trying to keep up with technology or just keeping up with trends. And, and as the world changes, it seems as if the wisdom of of the older generations tend to be discounted for the young energy of the youth. Justice matters. When it comes to gender, I mean, we, we don't have to go any further than, than maybe some of our workplaces or, or even some of our own presuppositions when it comes to, to gender uh, understandings of, of responsibilities and roles and, and even, even wages. I mean, let, let, let's be honest, I was looking at, at the demographics for just the Puget Sound region this last week, and, and there is incredible income inequity among genders. There just is. Justice matters. Or when it comes to economic class, those who seem to, to be more well-off financially, wealthy, are taken advantage of by the poor, and the poor are taken advantage of by the wealthy, and, and it just is what it is. We don't mean it. It's sometimes, oftentimes, baked into our, our subconscious psyche, but justice does matter. Certainly with race, justice matters. Religion, <laughs> justice matters, as we see in this psalm. An injustice, it's not right, it's not fair. So let's just call it what it is, all right? Let's call it what it is, it's sin. Let's spell it out, S-I-N, it's sin. It's broken systems, it's broken people. Like you and me, Paul's right in Romans chapter three. He says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you're into the law of thermodynamics and the science and physics, we know that the first law of thermodynamics is energy is not created or destroyed. It's only transferred, so, so it's just being passed around. But the second law of thermodynamics, we know that everything has a tendency to move from order to disorder. So in other words, even sin, it is unraveling us. And we all know it. And if we're honest with ourselves, we've all experienced it to some degree or another. Justice matters. And here's how many of us, we, we respond to sin. Let, let, <laughs> let's just paint the picture of reality. This is how you and I, and especially me, I'm just going to look in the mirror today. This is how I respond to sin. Maybe, maybe you can relate. Uh, we take matters into our own hands solely. All the anger... All, all the rage over the broken systems and injustices, all of our disgust and sadness, it all comes together. And it's exactly what, what preacher, author Andy Stanley says, where, where we live in a world where we believe that might makes right and it all becomes about power and control and becoming heavy-handed. And if, if I could have the louder voice, then I win. And some of us, we hear that and we just disengage. We don't talk about it, we avoid it, we become silent, and, and we know that even in our silence it's not right, but, but maybe we don't know what to do, we're, we're just overwhelmed with everything else in life, it's just, wow, it's just too much. Maybe we're afraid of, of, of saying the wrong thing or getting it wrong, so we just disengage, and it's like cutting the rope, we just, we just separate ourselves, and, and it becomes a vicious cycle because when we do that, the guilt sets in, and and then we become enraged with ourselves. And, and much like David, we, we develop sort of this negative self-talk and, and sit in our self-pity and our own guilt. And it goes over and over and we feel weak and insignificant. And we're just one voice and what difference can we make? 
And so we take justice into our own hands by disengaging. Or on the other side of the horse, others of us, we engage, and, and this is what I call it, we engage in word vomit, right? And, and you know what I'm talking about when I say word vomit. Uh, <laughs> they're just words that just spill out of our mouth or spill out of our fingertips or thumbs, uh, whether it's on social media or wherever we take out our words and, and we take justice into our own hands because... Again, we assume that might makes right, and, and the louder we get, the more powerful we become. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. And maybe today we just repent of both of those for disengaging, and we repent of, of the word vomit that maybe we have been a part of. We repent of our sin. We repent of the brokenness. We repent of the injustice, even that we do not know the brokenness in our own lives again We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So what do we do? Well, let's look down at the psalm, all right? There's two things here that David does when he's sinking in this sense of injustice. <laughs> Check it out, verse 16. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is what? It's good. God's love is good. According to your abundant mercy, Please turn to me, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Uh, he prays for deliverance. He prays for mercy. God, remind me of your love. Remind me you are still good. Remind me that this is not really your idea of what life is like. Remind me of your goodness. Remind me of the hope and the sunrise that comes in the morning. Indeed, remind me of the joy that comes in the morning. The second thing that, that we discover here, uh, drop down to verse 19. You know my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My foes are all known to me. Reproaches have broken my heart, so I have a broken heart over everything so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was no one. So, so no one's in my court. I feel alone and comforters. I found none. And they gave me poison for food and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. And so even, even what I tried, it, it just became sour. You can write this down. Not only do we pray for deliverance, we expect continued brokenness. And that's a really hard word to say because we want to right the wrongs. We want to make things better, but, but notice what David here is saying in, in the injustice it is, in a way, expected that brokenness is going to continue on some level. That's just the way it is. Admiral Stockdale, uh, in Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, he shares the story of Admiral Stockdale. And, and he shares the story of how Admiral Stockdale, he was in the POW camp, and uh, this was during the Vietnam War in the Hanoi Hilton. And, and if you follow war history, if you're into war history, maybe you've read Jim Collins' book, you're familiar with the story. Uh, but he's observing different prisoners of war, and, and it was a horrific experience. And, and as, as these prisoners of war would wait for their, their rescue, they would look out, and he would look out at the different behaviors and postures of of these soldiers, he noticed that, that some became so overly optimistic that they would be rescued by Christmas, that, that, that they were sorely disappointed when they weren't. Others looked at their day, day to day, and, and just fell deeper into despair, wondering if they would ever experienced life on the other side of this camp again, and many of them became depressed and suicidal. And, and, and what he realized and what he observed is that both parties, those who had unwavering hope and deep, dark despair and lostness and wandering, both of them struggled to survive. And he took away what, what is now known as the Stockdale Paradox, Two things that seemingly uh, don't really fit together, but in reality they do. That in order to walk through hard times, we need both unwavering hope and brutal honesty. Brutal honesty and unwavering hope, they go 
together. We need to know that, that injustice is here and is wrong and that there is hope for a brighter future, a better future, God's preferred future. So what's, what is that solution? What, what is the solution for both brutal honesty and unwavering hope? Um, I, I, this was put on my desk earlier this week. Uh, this is from Tim Keller's devotion book, The Songs of Jesus. Honestly, I don't even know who put this on my desk. I came back from lunch one day and it was there. So <clears throat> I, I'm just going to take that as, as a sign from God maybe. Uh, but this devotion w- is just incredible and I want to read it to you, okay? He says here specifically about these verses, Psalm 69, the psalmist prays that his betrayers would be damned, cursed, judged. Justice would come to them. How do we read this? He continues. First, this startles us into feeling something, a desperation that produced it, keeping us from being complacent about injustice in the world. But it also foreshadows Jesus' suffering. Jesus is the one who was given sour wine to drink. Jesus experienced injustice himself on the cross, dying a criminal's death when he wasn't a criminal reminds us that we stand in a very different place from the psalmist on the other side of the cross. He continues, Stephen looked to Jesus for vindication or justice, not retribution, and prayed for his enemies as they killed him, as did Jesus himself. The psalmist is right to want judgment on evil, but Jesus takes it himself. And this forever changes our view of our own deserts and the way we seek justice. Did you catch that? On this side of the cross, realize the psalmist, he's on the other side of the cross. He hadn't experienced the life, death, crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus. But when I look back at the cross and the injustice that was done to the Son of God, When I see Jesus' act of of justice for me on the cross, it just doesn't change the way I think. It just doesn't change the way I see the world and the injustice around me. It it, it literally melts my heart. It changes my heart. Because as I look out, I I, I see the light in Jesus uh, in in light of the injustice that, that in many ways have been caused by my own choices. And my own decisions, and my own thoughts, and my own behaviors, and my own actions. Talk about being humbled. That that, that we all have contributed both to to the sin side, but also we all have have received this justice from, from God through the personal work of Jesus Christ. In other words, my justice isn't just against other people, and my injustice isn't just against other people. My injustice is actually against Jesus himself on the cross that he took to the cross. He nailed that injustice to the cross, and instead he offers me not judgment but grace. That he's the humble one in spite of my human pride. That he's the defenseless one in spite of my defensiveness. That his power is the one that gives me grace for my weakness in silence. His power is the one that gives me strength to listen and seek understanding when all I want to do is word vomit. And how can we say that? The Apostle Paul says this to Timothy, all right? Check it out. Here's a true statement, he says, that should be accepted without question. Jesus Christ came into the world to save who? Sinners. That'd be you and me. Broken people, broken systems, broken world, for which I am the worst of them. And so if we're going to compare ourselves, let's compare ourselves to to who the greatest sinner is, who the the most broken person is. Because where, where brokenness resides and we're honest with that, grace abounds even more. I love what Diedrich Bonhoeffer says about this. He says, The imprecatory psalm leads us to the cross of Jesus and to the love of God which forgives even our enemies. I cannot forgive the enemies of God out of my own resources. Only the crucified Christ can do that. And I through him. So we are forgiven and now, now we can forgive other people. I've said this before. Forgiven people forgive people. And thus, the carrying out of vengeance or justice on our own becomes grace for all men and women in Jesus Christ. 
See, God gives us a renewed sense of justice on this side of the cross. When we look that justice is already taken out on Jesus himself, it shapes and changes the way we see the inequities and the injustice around us. And actually what what it does for ages, I I love what what the Bible, it just puts it out here in front of us uh, when it comes to age. It says both, do not let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example, young people. You're an example for believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity and it's not it's not either or and older folks wisdom is with the aged and understanding and length of days justice matters for gender in jesus there is no jew or gentile there's neither slave or free there's neither male or female for you are all one in christ galatians says justice matters you see in jesus rich and poor have this in common proverbs says the lord is the maker of them all so even in, in, in our economies, wealthy and poor, the Lord is the maker of us all. Justice matters. Certainly there's, there's race. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, or slave or free, but Christ is in all and is all in all. Colossians 3 says that. Justice matters. And it's the justice of Jesus on the cross that sets all things right for us so that we can work to set all things right, not in the way we think it should be, but in the way God sees it. You see, here's something I learned this week. When we begin to legalize grace, when we begin to systemize grace, when we begin to control God's grace, (laughs) injustice increases all the more. Think about it. When when, when we try to systemize and, and blanket grace and grace has to be this way or grace just is passively given and I don't really have to take responsibility for, for actually sharing anything, it actually creates a greater injustice. We'll talk more about that on the Monday morning podcast tomorrow morning, all right? But, but here, here, here's my takeaway. As I'm sitting here with this psalm, grace was never meant to be passively shared Jesus just did, didn't die on the cross and say, hope, hope you all figure it out. No, grace was meant to be actively given. Grace was meant to, to have a relationship, not just with Jesus, but, but as Jesus walks with us and we walk with others. You see, God has a solution, and it's in Jesus who comes and, and puts on human flesh and walks in human injustice. He comes uh, so that we can do the same and walk alongside of people experiencing injustice in a really real and upfront and personal way. You see, Jesus followers, we are Jesus to the world of injustice justice around us as we ooze grace. We are the ones who give grace. Grace is not a passive experience. It's an active experience that we give to others because it has been first given to us. See, justice and grace, there are two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. And yet justice matters. (laughs) Justice matters to God. Because God chooses to bring his verdict that you are his child, you are loved, you are forgiven. There is nothing you can do to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, your Lord. And that judgment has been brought on the person of Jesus on the cross and to the world through him as well. Justice matters to God. And you are God's solution to injustice in the world today. Not by yourself, not by your own power, not maybe in the ways that that we think justice needs to be carried out, but we come alongside of others because we ooze grace among an unjust world, alongside of people experiencing injustice in life, in culture, in our systems, and in our world to bring equity, and love. This is what it means, folks, to love God as we have been loved, to love others as we have been loved, to live like Jesus when it comes to justice and grace. So here are some next steps, all right? Um, Three of them, you can write them down, and and you can choose to take your next step maybe today. Uh, Maybe you just want to sit on this, pray about it. Uh, But but here are three three next steps you you can consider. One, uh, commit to not taking justice solely into your own hands. This is an individual commitment, all right? But rather engage with injustice, with humility and grace, specifically the humility and grace that we have in Jesus. So that's the first next step. Commit 
So not taking justice solely into your own hands. Don't disengage. Don't word vomit. But, but rather engage in justice with humility and grace. The humility and grace of Jesus. You may choose to take the next step. Here's the second option, all right, second choice. Uh, to make plans now, we're going to be launching into a fall Bible study that wrestles with, with justice and grace, specifically in the realm of race, but, but it, it, it applies to almost every area of life. It does. And so, so be praying about what that means, and there'll be opportunities for you to learn more about when that's going to happen, both virtually and perhaps maybe in person. Uh, we're, we're still learning and, and figuring out what that looks like, but, but that's coming up here beginning later in September. But here, here, here's the third next step that, that I want to encourage you, and, and it's an important one. Because none of us walk alone. And I I would invite you to take the next step. Invite someone. Invite someone. Maybe it's a a friend. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a grandchild. Maybe it's a parent. Someone to walk alongside of you to learn more and to stand up for God's idea of justice. Because we don't walk alone. David didn't walk alone. Yes, he walked with God. (laughs) But he didn't walk alone. And neither do we. And so as we seek God's justice, we know God's justice matters, that we are, in a sense, God's justice in an unjust, unjust world. Because we have been shown justice through the person and work of Jesus. So go and live like Jesus when it comes to justice and grace. Let's pray. God, this is a hard, hard message. <laughs> it might be an unpopular message. And yet, we know that you are a God who brings equity and grace. Judgment on your son, Jesus, for the world, for us. Because we have sinned. We admit that that we are broken people, that we are in a broken world, and, and we cannot save ourselves. Thank you for Jesus, for not just being the solution but for being our power and our weakness when we disengage, when we word vomit, and not just as a quick band-aid, but but you actually change our hearts. Lord, for those of us who, who need that continual reminder and shaping, and that'd be all of us, continue to teach us what this means. We admit we don't have the answer. We don't have the full answer, but we know where it begins. May we keep our eyes fixed on you. For you are grace and truth. You are justice and judgment. And it's in you we find our hope and the reality that in an unjust world, we know that your justice creates a better heaven that we look forward to in the time to come. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. My name is Marvin McDonald. I'm Sandy McDonald, and we're the McDonald's. And we'd like for you to pray with us. If you would, please bow your heads. I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God. It changes me. This is from C.S. Lewis. We pray for the sick and the infected, those who are suffering, for the vulnerable, the elderly, those with chronic medical conditions, the mentally ill, the homeless. May the Holy Spirit give them the understanding that you are with them and give them the comfort. And may they also get help where they need help, Lord Jesus. We pray for the medical professionals who are bravely embracing their call to serve. Give them a special shield of protection as they go about their duties. And we thank you so much for the grace and these very special people that you have put in our lives. For the scientific community taking the lead in the understanding of the virus and, and discovering a cure. Let us understand that you are the lead scientist while all at the same time embracing and praying for the work that these men and women are doing. For our families, struggling with so much change, seeking to comply with recommended strategies that they work together during this time. Give our families a special understanding that will allow us to remain calm and loving to each other as we pass through this time. 
And for workers everywhere facing layoffs and financial hardships, Lord, we ask that you give them the ability to find work that will allow them to support their family and loved ones and give us the ability to help those who are in need. For the health care leaders, that they may have the knowledge and wisdom to meet each challenge, giving us the understanding as we listen to their suggestions for us to meet the pandemic head on and to do as we are asked. And for our local, state, federal government leaders who have the strength and resolve to have the strength and resolve to do what is best, most of all for their understanding that they need to seek your counsel through their precious word and that they will get down on their knees for your guidance. Also, Lord, we would also like to pray for people that uh, have the COVID virus, uh, pray for them and their families. Uh, it's hard to be in isolation. Uh, pray for patients. Um, also, we'd like to pray for um, the students uh, of all ages that are some going back to school, some online. This is just so different for a lot of people and, and, and kids sometimes don't understand. We pray for their parents and um, uh, to help them get through all this because this is the first time we've gone through something like this. So we, we uh, would like to have special prayers for them. We thank you for all this, Lord. Join us in the Lord's prayer at this time. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, Marv and Sandy. You can take a moment to let us know you're here. Complete a connection card. We would love for you to connect with us so we can stay connected with you. So go ahead and tap that box above the video if you're on OSLC.com or the appropriate link in the Facebook comment section, all right? And let us know how we can pray for you, how we can connect and serve you here this week, all right? Also, you can take this moment to respond by giving an offering. You can give by clicking the appropriate links or tap on the give box above the video on the OSLC.com webpage. While you're responding, let's check out to see what's happening at OSLC Life. It's me. Hey. Ha <laughs> ha, live. Hey, here we go. Uh, here's what's going on at OSLC Life. Busy bags uh, are here, and they are ready to move from here into your home. They do us no good hanging out at 4519. So if you would like a busy bag for your kids or even your kids' friends, all right, hey, go ahead and mark that on your connection card, available for ages 3 plus and 7 plus here starting this week, all right? Also, family photo challenge. We shared about that this week, all right? Uh, village people, again, uh, yeah, no please. All right. Um, and then finally, uh, send a greeting. All right. You, you notice those greetings, still photos, uh, short video clips. You can learn more and upload those videos and pictures at oslc.com slash greeting. All right. Hey, it, it's been a blessing to worship with you. It's great to have our band, our worship team back uh, leading worship here today. And so go with God's blessing as you make disciples to love God, love people, and live like Jesus in God's justice and grace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor, his justice, his grace, and his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. No one like you, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you, none like you. My God is greater, our God is strong. Higher than any other, my God. 
Oh, 